Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and today I'm really excited to be here with author and speaker Sabrina McDonald. Um, we're going to be talking today specifically about her book, A Home Built from Love and Loss, Coming Together as a Blended Family. And Sabrina, thank you so much for being here to talk about this incredible book and just the whole topic of blending a family and the role that faith and prayer play in that. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. Yeah, well, we have never done anything like this. I, we have never, we've had episodes about healing relationships and, you know, different kinds of things, um, but never this specific topic. And it's a long time coming. So I'm so excited to be able to bring this into um, really the resources and tools that we want to equip our listeners with to be able to to live more freely in relationship with God, in relationships with other people. But before we get into actually talking about um, the book, I, I want, we like to ask all of our guests, what is your favorite prayer closet? So um, it could be off the wall. It could be something, you know, it could be a literal closet. It could be anywhere that you go to connect with God and, and to pray and to meet with him. Uh, mine happens to be a literal closet. I love that. I love the literal <laughs> yeah. closets. Tell us about I, your I closet. Really do. I there's a closet in uh, I actually have my closet in my bathroom mm -hmm. and there in it's just a quiet place. It's in the back of the house. It is very uh, intimate and literally when I am uh, at my wind's end or I just really feel like I've got to have this deep deep prayer time, that is exactly where I go to the closet. <laughs> I love that. So, yeah, I'm down on my knees. I mean, I'm in there. I've got the door closed. I've got the other door closed. <laughs> so, that's where I go. That really is my go-to place in the closet. For many years, I had my prayer closet when the kids were little. So they're they're older now. I've got a 10-year-old, a 13-year-old, and an almost 18-year-old now. And when they were little, though, I remember my favorite prayer closet was our garage because yeah. it was accessible by our house. So I always, you know, I was not, I was just a door away but mm -hmm. I would walk into the garage to like take the trash out or whatever it was. And I would just want to stay there sometimes. But sometimes I specifically went out there to pray because I think some of it was just sensory. Um, like, what is it? Like no sensory inputs there because it was dark. I wouldn't turn the light on. It was usually kind of cool. I live in Alaska, so it's pretty much always cool. Even in the summer, the, the garages. Um, and it just felt quiet and and totally cut off from anybody else and especially when you've got kids tugging at your you know mm -hmm. tugging at your shirt and wanting your attention it was it was a great place even for just a minute or two to go out yeah. there and just meet with god but there's something about you know i mean the bible even says go into your closet and shut the yeah. door and like there's something about that kind of prayer i mean i'm all for and probably better at the kind of prayer that's on the fly in the crack time when I'm just going out and doing other things, but there's something very important and special, I think about prayer closet time. So that's really true. I mean, I, I'm like you, you know, I pray all day, you know, Paul said, pray without ceasing. Yeah. I think when he said that he meant pray throughout the day, pray all day long, which I do, but there are those times when you, you know, there's just something. And Jesus told us to go and pray. He said, pray like the widow who wants um, who wants to get justice from the judge and just keep yes. banging on that door until you are given the justice that you want. And so a lot of times that's what I do. I'll go in there and I'll be on the floor and I'll say, Lord, you told me, this is how you told me to pray. <laughs> you told me to pray and bang on that door to get what I need or to get what I want. And here I am. So in those moments, that's where I go directly to the closet. Absolutely. <laughs> well, First, before we actually get into discussing the book, I just want to thank you. Like, I want to thank you for, it had to take courage to write the things that you wrote in this book. It had to take, um, I, I imagine, and I can, you can answer this later, but I imagine it was probably painful to relive some of this and to process some of these things. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, from the get go, like the first paragraph, it's like, wow, she's sharing this like she's <laughs> she's still married to this guy and she is sharing this stuff. I mean, I am so blessed that I am I am not I've never blended a family, um, but it 
it's an incredible book that I came away with feeling like I'm more equipped, not only to pray for and understand people who are blending families, but just some of the things in the book are applicable to everybody that goes through tough stuff with relationships and with children and with everything else. So, I mean, I just thank you. And I think it could be very beneficial to foster parents, adoptive parents, parents of blended families, um, and even just your kind of run of the mill, like got married, had kids, parents right. and, and relationships. So mm -hmm. anyway, any, any kind of loss that a person's gone through. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, this is a valuable book for them and people that have adopted kids or have foster kids or, um, lots of different forms of a family. That's just not traditional. It's, if you've got anyone in your family that wasn't born into that family in your home, even if you have a grandparent living with you or any form of a family that, that is the, your non-traditional nuclear family mm -hmm. is going to benefit from this. That's a blended family. It yeah. is. I had a, I had a girl one time telling me about the problem she was having with her daughter and her foster daughter. So the foster daughter was a teenager. Her daughter was a teenager. And she thought, well, they'll get along. They'll come here. They'll be friends. And she was connecting with the foster daughter and it was making her daughter jealous. And she was like, what is going on? I said, you are a blended family. And that's what's happening right now. <laughs> yeah. So she didn't even think of herself as a blended family, but actually by adding that one foster child in there, it started to create these dynamics that she wasn't expecting. So yes, a lot of people are blended families that don't even realize that they're in a blended family. Yeah. Well, and for your personal story, there's the added layer or dimension of actual loss, having been a widow and your now husband is a widower. Um, so this is also just like you said, a very beneficial book um, for anyone who's suffered any kind of loss. Um, could you maybe just give us an overview of how you became a blended family? Sure. Um, my first husband was killed in a car accident and, um, he, he was only 37 years old. We'd only been married seven years. So my son was only two years old and my daughter was a newborn baby. She was only three months old. So he got up for work one morning and never came back home. So we never got to say goodbye. And it was so tragic. It was so, it, obviously the most difficult thing I've ever gone through, but in our case, we just had a really, really happy relationship. We had a very, very good marriage. We were best friends and um, it was a devastating loss. And so I was a widow for three years and my husband, Robbie, my current husband, um, he was um, married to his wife for 22 years and she died of cancer and it happened very rapidly. So they found her cancer in May and by July she had died. And um, it was also very shocking for him because they expected her to live. She was so young and, you know, she had been healthy and then suddenly she was not healthy and then just what you're gone. Um, and so, um, he was widowed for two years before we got married. And then, um, when we got together, he had a son that was already grown and was on his own. And then he had a teenage son and then I had the two little ones. So my children were five and three and his was 14 when we got married. And, uh, so we, it was definitely a blended family, <laughs> very strangely blended family. I actually, the funny thing is that I, I tried to talk him out of getting married to me many times, oh. um, because our families were just so, our children were 20 years apart from the oldest to the youngest. And he just said, no, I just believe that God wants me to be a father. Cause I said, are you crazy? You know, you're almost done. You've got a 14 year old and you're going to marry me and then you're going to have two more, but he has actually adopted my two children. And so they're, they're now fully his. So, um, even though we kept their, their middle name, but we added a middle name. So their previous name is that now their middle name. So they have four names. Um, but, uh, so I wanted to keep that kind of connection with their biological father, but they've grown up with him being their dad. So those first years were really difficult, um, with the blending, but, um, but now, uh, they just think of him as their dad, you know, they don't, they don't see him in any other way. So, well, you, we you together. kind of touched on, um, just when we were talking about who this book is for the idea of it being for anyone who's gone through loss or grief, um, any blended family or relationship. And, and you talked a little bit about this foster parent situation where to me, I feel like the common denominator of a lot of this is unmet expectations 
and you're having one expectation going into the relationship or the situation, whether it's adoption or foster or um, remarriage or even marriage. And right. when you get into it, you realize, oh, wow, like my hopes, my dreams, my prayers, my expectations, none of this is is panning out the way I had hoped. Can you talk about what that's like? I mean, you illustrate it very well in your book. You're very honest about how that panned out. Could you just give us a picture of what that could look like, having one expectation going into a situation and being just having a rude awakening of what the reality is? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Expectations is part of the grief. Of course, there's a lot of it that, you know, for a blended family, you just have a lot of loss. So you've yeah. you've lost parents you've even if they're divorced and they're not dead you've lost that connection with them but yes what you're saying is very true that the expectation just what you expect in your life um and it's not the way that you thought it would be and you're you 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 for example um uh there are so many of them that we could go through in our life but um i just expected my second marriage to be like my first marriage for example so my first marriage we we had we were close friends um, we had a lot of things in common. Um, we thought the same things were funny. We liked the same kind of movies. And you just think that when you marry this other person, that it's all going to be the same as it was before. Um, but I've often told people that it's like being married again is kind of like um, growing up in Spain and learning or, or moving to Spain and learning Spanish and learning the Spanish traditions and learning to love their food. And then you get up and you move to Germany. Well, none of the things that you learn in Spain translate to the German culture. Mm. You know, now you have to learn a whole new language and learn to eat whole new food and learn whole new holidays, everything, you know, everything changes. So even though you had to make all those changes the first time, you think you've learned a lot of things and you have, but they don't translate into the new situation. So, you know, my first husband, he didn't hunt, he didn't um, fish. Um, he was more of a sports guy, you know, so I learned a lot about football and, and fantasy football and all these things. Well, my new husband, he's into more outdoorsy things. He does a lot of fishing and hunting and spends a lot of time, you know, away from me. Um, my first husband was more of a, you know, businessman. He did a lot of that. Well, my new husband's a military man. So just a completely different atmosphere and all these things that you think that you know about marriage and relationships. You have to relearn them all. And that was very, very frustrating to me, having had such a successful first relationship and then trying to move on to a new relationship and struggling, not knowing how to connect with this person. So there was a lot of tears shed. And, but then in a blended family, the, the problem or the complication worsens because everybody deals with that when they get married, right? So every couple, every newlywed couple has the same changing dynamic you have to start to redefine who you are as a person you know you're as you're beginning to become one with this other person so that's bound to happen but one of the other things you don't expect in a blended family is the web of relationships so every single person in the household is going through the same process that you're going through so now no longer am i just worrying about the changes in myself and being frustrated for myself I'm also being frustrated about the changes and the hurt feelings and the misunderstandings between my new spouse and my children. So you start to see that. And as a mom or as a parent, you're looking at your own kids and you're worrying about them as well as the disconnect between you and your new spouse. So there's a whole web of relationships. There's not just, so you've got, I mean, if you imagine drawing a line between all these people, you know, with just a couple, you've got one line drawn between them. But then when you start adding all these other people and you're drawing lines through, you know, from all these different connections, and then you add on grandparents and then you add on in-laws and then you add on, you know, the exes and everybody else that's involved in this, there's just a web of relationships there. And people get, you know, they get, they feel disconnected. They feel overlooked. They feel, um, you know, left out. And then you have identities that change with the kids. So if you have a child, you know, for example, our teenager was the youngest in his family. And then he married into my family. Now, suddenly he's the oldest and not just the oldest, but the oldest by far. Mm -hmm. So he went from being a baby and really kind of, you know, not having to worry about responsibility and all of that 
to a home where now he's expected to be the oldest and to act the oldest. And my kids, my son, who had been the oldest child in my house household was now the middle child. So there was just a whole variety of expectations that everybody had to <laughs> learn how to, they're like, what's happening? You know, it's like your world kind of turns upside down. So the first, the first time you lose, when you lose someone, like when we had the death of our family members, that turns your world upside down. When you get married, a lot of people think in a blended family, oh, this will solve our problems. It'll turn the world right side up. And then you get into it and you realize, no, all it does is just create more, co- more chaos in your heart and in your mind and in your identity, who you, who you are. So it can be very, very scary and hard, you know, for everyone involved, for the adults, for the children, for the, for the grandparents, you know, they're wondering, am I going to be left out? So um, it's, it's a difficult, it's a, it's an extremely chaotic transition from even from the loss that you have before to getting into a blended family. Well, I can imagine that for someone going through it, it has to be pretty scary, but for someone to read your book and realize that, oh my goodness, I'm not the only one, you know, because I think there's got to be guilt. Do you agree that there was guilt involved in the feelings that you were having? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guilt is a major factor in blended families. It's a major factor. A lot of parents get sucked in, you know, by, by all of the what ifs Mm -hmm. and, you know, the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Yes. And that just means that he comes along and whispers in your ear, all the things that you've done wrong. And, and you have done things wrong. You have, we have, we've made mistakes in our family as parents. We made mistakes when we were single and dating and the children saw all of that. And so, you know, Satan comes along and he doesn't have to make up anything. He can just tell you exactly what you did and just keep reminding you of the things that you already knew were wrong. Of course, he doesn't remind you that you're forgiven. <laughs> he doesn't remind you that you can be redeemed, you know, that even the actions, the things that you did wrong, can't, that God can use them for good. He doesn't remind you of those things. He just comes in and whispers in your ear over and over, well, you did this. And just think if you hadn't done this, then that wouldn't happen. So everything that you see, you know, if your child's grades start to go down, you go, oh, well, maybe I did the wrong thing. You know, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Or if your spouse and your child's not getting along, oh, maybe I married the wrong person. You know, what if I married this other person that I was dating or who's interested in me? And then you start to compare your spouse with these other people. And that's when you start to disconnect your heart, you know? So that guilt factor can be a huge problem, um, both as a parent, because you let your child get away with more than what they should. You know, that was, I think for us, that's where we really struggled was that our children (laughs) weren't, they should have been, you know, kept in line more. I won't say punished more, but they weren't held to their, to the standard that they would have been, um, had we not felt the guilt that we felt. So we let the kids get away with a lot. And, um, you know, and a lot of it was because we just felt like it was our fault, you know, that they were suffering in some way. But reality is that life brings tragedy, no matter who you are, even if we've been a perfectly wonderful, put together nuclear family, you know, there is tragedy in life. So I had to continually remember, remind myself that you cannot protect them from everything. You know, God is their protector. God knows what he's doing. And he allows people to go through suffering in life so that we can learn lessons of whatever reason. So the Bible says that, that, um, God comforts us and he gives us this comfort so that we can comfort others with the comfort that we have been given. Well, you can't be comforted unless you've gone through something traumatic or, you know, some, some sort of suffering. So, I think we try to shield our kids from that so often. Blended families are notorious for that. Um, But we just have to see see the process as it is and allow God to use it in the way that he uses it and just continually pray for our children. I I love the emphasis of this podcast because that is such a key in blended families. I mean, it's just a matter of holding on and waiting for God to do his work. And so much of a successful blended family is holding on. It's waiting on God. It's trusting God to do what he said he would do, you know, raise them up in the way that they should go. And when they were, when they're old, they will not depart from it. Those types of promises that we have to hang on and hold on to ourselves to close to our heart and say, Lord, you said this, and that's what I'm trusting you to do. Cause that's what your word says. 
So, you know, it, it is a lot of those first few years, um, blended family experts will say that it takes anywhere from five to seven years for a blended family to really feel like family. Um, and that's a long time yeah. when you're waiting and waiting for that to take place. Because a regular, you know, a, new, a nuclear family, when children are born into a family, immediately you have that bond and they are coming into a home with parents who had at least nine months to form their bond together before the baby got there. In a blended family, you don't have that. You don't have that honeymoon period before the children enter the scene. So, and they don't come one at a time or even two at a time. They come <laughs> all at once, you know? So it's a very complicated situation as far as bonding is concerned. So it takes a long time to build up that trust and um, for everybody to learn to have affection toward one another. And sometimes it never happens. And that's just, that's just the fact. Sometimes there's a person in the family who doesn't want to bond and that's okay. You can't force that. You can't make it happen. And all you can do is again, pray and let the Lord work in their heart. Do you have any advice? Um, just kind of looking back on your own experience through things that you wish you had done or things that you feel like you did that were helpful and beneficial to someone in terms of praying for your kids through this transition or praying for your relationship or what what prayer advice do you have for someone going through this process well for me i think number one find a place where you can go and pray you know we yeah. were talking about have your find one place. or make one <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so there has to be a place where you can go and just really be yourself you know where you can cry and you can cry tears and also cry out, you know, to the Lord. And, um, if you don't have that place, you really need to have a place to do that. So sometimes, you know, I think people will pray in a public place or outdoors. Maybe that's not where you want to be. If you can't just be yourself, you know, if you can't really cry and pray, um, because, you know, my kids would come in and see me crying and praying and they'd think something was wrong or, you know, what did I do mom or whatever. Um, so you have to have a place where you can really just shut the door, be alone, not be disturbed and, and, um, and do those really hard prayers. <laughs> um, it's great to be praying in the car. I mean, we were saying this earlier, you know, it's wonderful to pray all day. You should pray throughout the day. Um, but I think we all need that place. I think the other thing too, is that every single night I would meet with my kids just for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and I would pray for them. And I would ask them, you know, how was your day? How are things going? And that was the place. And it, it sounds terrible because obviously I married my husband and I love him, but I thought, I don't know him. I don't know him. What if he abuses my children? What if he, um, you know, makes them feel uncomfortable in some way that's legitimate, you know? So I would ask them, or maybe their older brother had done something. I don't know. You know, I, I didn't know them. They didn't know me. And as much as I believed that I could trust them, um, I wanted to trust them. Turns out I could trust them. They, nothing like that ever happened. But at the time, I wanted to make sure it didn't. So I would sit and talk to my kids and I would ask them, how can I pray for you? And I prayed over them every single night. Mm -hmm. And part of that was because I wanted them to know that God was their stabilizer, um, that they had lost a father and this new man that we were calling daddy that was confusing them at first, um, that he wasn't their real father, that God was their father and that he's the one that takes care of us. And I wanted them to know that that's where we went to have our needs met. It wasn't to these people in our home. It wasn't like this new daddy was a savior. Um, it wasn't like the old daddy was the only one there was, and there was no one else and that he, now he's gone. Um, but that we had, they had a father, we have a father, mm -hmm. he's my father and theirs. And so I would pray with them every night, um, just so that they would know that that's where we went for, for prayer time. And I think that's good for anyone. Again, whether you've lost someone or not, you know, whether you've been divorced, whether you're in a blended family, praying with your kids every night is, um, is a really great exercise for all of you, you know, and it bonds you together, but it also, um, puts the emphasis on where it needs to be. He's our savior you know, not, not our circumstances, not our identity in the home, but the Lord is the one who's, who works the miracles in our lives. He's the one that can answer our prayers. That is so good. I love that. I feel like that is, I mean, that's the foundation of 
at all of our faith, you know, and it, but especially where the role of parent or the role of father comes into play. Um, mm -hmm. That's very, a, a really valuable lesson. And I love that idea of giving your kids space with you and like providing an opening for that relationship with God as well but just not to expect them to all of a sudden play family, like to give them this opportunity to be still just with you sometimes and, and to have that, that set aside time. That just is, that's such good advice. I think that's really good. Yes. That is essential. Mm. That really is essential. And that was probably my biggest mistake as a stepmom um, was not letting my husband spend time with his stepson. I say that that sounds too harsh. There were, for example, they used to go play golf every Saturday and, um, and I would complain about it because I was there with the little kids and they were off and they were having fun and it, it made me jealous really. I was like, well, you guys are having a great time out having fun without me. And here I'm stuck with the little kids, you know, three and five. And, um, I wanted to get away, you know, on a Saturday and maybe all of us could go spend time together on a weekend or do something. Um, it didn't have to be just me and my husband, but. I felt like they were taken off and leaving me with the little ones. But reality was that my stepson really needed that time with his dad. And I took that away from him and it wasn't purposeful. Like if I had gone, if I were going to tell myself some advice, <laughs> that would be it. Let him spend more time with his dad. I felt like they were, you know, like kind of going off and leaving me. I wanted to have this bonded family, you know, where we all got together and we all started making memories together and, you know, um, just being one big happy family. But, you know, when you, when you think about it from the teenager's perspective, you're going, Hey, he was my dad. And now y'all are taking him away from me. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I were wise, I would have left more time for him and his dad. I had the time with my kids, you know, like I was saying about 15 minutes every night, we just spent that time together every night together. And that was actually funny. Um, when I first married Robbie, I thought, well, I'll just let Robbie go in and, you know, spend 15 minutes with them, put them in the bed and then I'll come in and pray with them. And they were absolutely just devastatedly offended, you know, like, why is he in here? This is our time. Why do you let him come in here? So the, he, they would not have it. Even my daughter was three years old. You know, I thought she would just really love having a father there, but she never, she didn't remember ever having a father. So that was a completely foreign idea to her. And, um, cause I had a great relationship with my dad, you know, and I thought, oh, they finally have what I had as a child. They've got a father in their life. And, and, but they, that was a totally foreign idea. They had men in their life that they loved, like my brother and my dad, but you know, this idea of a, of a man who would come in and like, you know, sit down and tell them bed, bedtime stories and, you know, brush their hair or something. They were like, this is weird. You know, they just didn't <laughs> like that. Um, but when I was looking at my my husband's son, you know, that never occurred to me for some reason. So that was probably my, my, my biggest regret was that I did not leave that space for, for them to have their time together because the, the bonding of the family will happen if there are healthy roots. And so you have to have that establishment with the, with the biological family, with, you know, no, a trust there that you haven't abandoned me. You haven't left me. Um, but I'm just bringing you in. And so I should have allowed that to grow together much more slowly than I did. And I was trying so hard to push, you know, push that relationship. I really thought that the five of us could really bond really quickly. And in some ways there was, we, we actually bonded faster in some ways than, you know, the family outside of us. But, um, but, uh, I really wish that we had gotten, taken things a lot slower. That's, that's, that would have been good advice back then. And I think people gave me that advice. <laughs> I just didn't follow it very well. Yeah. Well, I love that picture that you give of roots, kind of like tending the roots that, you know, when you think of roots, they go off in different directions. So you've got, you know, this vein of roots that's you and your kids, a vein of roots that's your husband and his kids. And um, caring for those, you still have this plant this this plant that bears fruit and you know it's still all one plant but i like that picture that you give of tending those roots and allowing them to remain 
separate and tended separately so that the whole plant can grow healthily. I think that's so such yeah. good advice. Yeah, that that actually gets rid of some of the problems that my book addresses, you know, is is like I was telling you before, the blended family itself creates loss. And that's the way it does it is that, you know, a child comes into a blended family and feeling like, oh, everybody's, you know, we're all going to be like it was before. And then they find out that this spouse, this new spouse is taking all the attention of their parent. And um, that's where you start to get some of those losses that are created. Mm -hmm. So if we're not sensitive to that, then a child can really begin to grieve, not just the loss of their parent that's not in the home, you know, their, either their deceased parent or their divorced parent, but also they are grieving the loss of the parent in the home. And then a child can really begin to turn inward or to be angry or, you know, begin to act out in certain ways because they feel abandoned by their by their parent. Well, in your book, you talk about some myths and fears surrounding blended families. Could you go into a few of those? What are some common sure. ones that you see? Um, I got my own notes over here. Let me see here. Uh, well, I think there's a, there's one of them, one of my favorite ones to talk about is that you, that people think that you can't be happy and sad at the same time. And this Ooh, was just a such really a good one. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was really eye opening for me. Um, and that, you know, so we live, we kind of live in a society that doesn't want to tolerate sadness. Um, they want to everybody to be happy. Of course, we all love to be happy. Have you seen the movie um, Inside Out? It's a Pixar movie. Yeah, that exact. That's exactly what I thought of when you yeah. when you were talking because I think that movie really is very poignant. It really points yeah. that out. Yes, it does. And of course, you know, the whole time, Joy, the main character, is trying to say, "Hey, we don't want her to be sad. You know, we want her to be happy." And let's just try to, you know, put sadness over here in the corner and pretend mm -hmm. like she doesn't exist or, you know, kind of brush her off, give her another job to do. And, um, but of course, in the end of the movie, they find out that it's sadness itself that makes joy so much more exciting. So, so much grander. And um, that's kind of the world that we live in. You know, we, we, we live in a place where everybody, you know, don't cry and boys don't cry and big girls don't cry. And, you know, we don't want anybody to be sad. We want everybody to just buck it up and move on. And honestly, there is a time where you do have to buck up and move on. You have to continue living life. But that's the point is that you can be happy and sad at the same time. You don't have to pick and choose between the two. And I think when, when you're blending a family, you want so badly for everyone to be um, comfortable, have their place in the home, look happy because it takes away your guilt, right? As a parent, you feel a lot less guilt <laughs> when, you're, when your kids are happy and content, satisfied. And, um, so you, as a parent, you kind of want your kids and you keep pushing them and pushing them in that way. But really what they need to do is grieve. Everyone needs to grieve their losses. And when you allow room for that in your family, then people are able to be healthy. They're able to walk through that instead of, you know, suppressing it or hiding it. Because the thing about grief is that it always comes out in one way or another. So it's not always sadness. Sometimes it comes out in anger. Sometimes it comes out in bad grades or, um, you know, disobedience, rebellion, running away from home, um, severe depression. All these things are actually can be manifestations of grief that people are feeling in the home. And if you allow them to be sad and you're not just constantly saying, you know, don't be sad about that, or we're not going to talk about your mother, or, you know, uh, I don't want to hear about that woman, you know, that that left me or, you know, like demonizing the other parent or making, um, you know, it, a, it a, a shame or an embarrassment to speak about someone who's died. That kind of attitude is exactly what will cause a child to move inward and they'll feel like, well, this is shameful. And so instead, what we need to do is let them talk about it, ask them questions about it. And that doesn't mean you force them to talk about it. It just means you let them know that it's okay to talk about it. You know, so it might be you're driving home from school and you ask your child, I bet you miss your mom sometimes, you know, I bet you miss her. Um, they may say, yeah, or oh, I'm all right or whatever. And then no more, they won't say any more about it, but they will know now it's okay to talk about. It's not a forbidden subject. So, you know, that's where I think we just need to be aware that it's in 
in, in the house. But that doesn't mean we won't have happy memories or times we laugh together. Um, you know, a blended family home simply is going to be made of both sadness and gladness. And people need to learn to live with the tension between those two instead of trying to, you know, take away all the, the bad thoughts and feelings. I think people do that because they think they're going to make a child more depressed when in reality, they're just depressing them by forcing them to suppress what they feel. That is really good advice. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of talk about that when you described your wedding day, you kind of brought that into play where you, you know, you had this expectation that this is a joyful day. This is, you know, the culmination of all of my hopes and dreams, uh, you know, after the grief that you had experienced, you wanted to have joy mm -hmm. and you, you see that all of these people on both sides who had experienced loss of your husband, your then husband's wife that had passed, um, that they were experiencing both joy and sadness. Um, can you talk about that? I've experienced something similar with my father remarrying after mm. the loss of my mom. And, and I held those feelings and I felt guilty mm. as I was feeling grief and joy because I felt like I felt guilty that I was somehow I don't know, both dishonoring my mom in some way and also dishonoring my stepmom, whom I love dearly. And I'm so thankful she found my dad and he found her. But I felt like both of those, like I felt betrayal of both people in that moment that, and, and yeah, it's very confusing. <laughs> so could you talk about, <laughs> talk about your experience? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's very similar, you know, I mean, when, uh, when you, when you, get remarried, you know, you want to believe, okay, well, my grief is over now and I can move on and I'm, I'm finally going to, you know, find happiness again. And you look forward to all the, the great things. And, um, but you, know, <laughs> you forget when you're getting married, it's not just about you, you know, it's about everybody else in the family too. And, uh, I, I'll never forget walking in and, and hearing the sounds of the sniffles, you know, when I walked in, cause I just got married 10 years before, you know, and it wasn't like that, you know? <laughs> Yeah. So it was a very happy day. Everyone was, you know, elated and you didn't hear very many sniffles. If you did, it was tears of joy, you know? Right. And, um, of course the, uh, the, the room that we had our wedding was actually the exact same room that the funeral of, of Robbie's previous wife was in. So yeah. all the people or many of the people that were there, the last time they were there was for her funeral. Yeah. I didn't even know that at the time that that was something I found out later. So it was, um, I cannot imagine how surreal that must have been to, to be in a room where a person that you loved had died and then come back and then realize that the, that, their, that their spouse is getting remarried. And the reason why that's so hard is because, um, there's a lot of fear that comes along with that. You're afraid that the person will be forgotten, um, that they no longer matter, you know? So you wonder like, will and then, and then family members that are coming into the family, like grandparents, especially, they wonder, will I be embraced? Will I be mm -hmm. accepted? Um, you know, like my in-laws, they were fearful they might be forgotten. You know, right. will they be allowed to come, you know, be a part of our family? And of course we had all said yes. And we'd all said, oh yeah, you're a part of my, we'd all had these conversations, but saying it and doing it are two different things. And there's a lot of fear that comes along with that. So um, I, I think that's, that's part of the problem there is that again, you have that joy and the happiness that come hand in hand, but on a day like that, you know, they, it's hard to decide what am I going to be in this moment? You know, you like, you just have these conflicting feelings. Um, but anytime, you know, in our, in our house, for example, that those fears were unfounded, we ended up having very close relationships with both of our in-laws. I mean, sometimes I tell my husband, I'm like, I married you for my in-laws. That's, that's what, that's what I got out of the deal. <laughs> they're the most wonderful people on the planet and they have treated my children, you know, just like, just like their own grandchildren. So, um, you know, a lot of, you know, I think that's just the human experience. We just deal with the feelings and the emotions and you can't help, you know, the, the sadness and the sorrow. It, it was hard as a bride, you know, to go through all of it and, and, um, wishing that I had eloped. <laughs> And going, this was not the best use of my money. I wish I had all my money back. Oh. Um, so we, we laugh about it now, of course, you know, my husband and I, we call it two funerals and a wedding, what we call it. 
Um, Cause it was just, I mean, it was like so many surreal things. You walk in and you see, you know, my first husband's family is on my side, the bride side of the church. Um, when, you know, whereas 10 years later, earlier, they were on the other side, you know, so it's just, it was very surreal. And, um, I love that story really, because it shows how complicated it really is in a blended family. You really, you know, it's, it's the, it's the exact picture. It really is the exact picture of what a blended family is like. You walk in with all this naivete, you know, thinking that everything is going to be, the way you imagine it to be. So, you know, the knight in shining armor and then, you know, reality hits you as soon as you open the door, you know, it's like this happiness and sadness and sorrow and mixed feelings and fears all play a part in a blended family. And it just kind of starts right there at the altar and it follows you home, (laughs) but it does get better for those of you in a blended family. It does get better. You have to hang on. You just have to hang on and let God show you the beautiful places that he's going to take you. And sometimes beautiful places, in order to get to the destination, you have to go through those difficult times. You know, you're not going to get to a waterfall without having to hike down through the mountains and the hills to get there. So, you know, we, we're on a destination to get to a beautiful place and it will, there will be wonderful memories along the way. Hopefully there will be, you know, connection and bonding with your family some may not some will though and um, you're going to have these close connections but getting through those first four or five years especially is very very hard but if you'll hang on the prize is worth the effort so it is um, it's essential you know just to get your kid on your knees and pray do a lot of waiting on the lord You know, that was another thing I found is that um, I went through the scripture and I just started reading all these scriptures about waiting on the Lord. And there's like 50 of them. I mean, it is a very prominent theme throughout scripture to wait on the Lord. And I think we just get so in such a rush in the culture that we live in that we want everything to happen now the way we want it to happen. And um, we don't wait on the Lord and we're forced to in a blended family situation it's a requirement. Um, when you get in a hurry, that's when you start hurting feelings and breaking hearts. And we did our share of that. And, um, and then you realize, you know what, I don't need to pressure anybody. I just need to pray. I need to, I need to let the Lord do his work and stop trying to control the situation myself. It's a very, very valuable situation. I wish I had known that before I had my own blended family. That is such good advice for someone that's kind of in the middle of it and just kind of feels like they're, they're just holding all of these unmet expectations, maybe even bitterness against like toward God because of those unmet expectations, like feeling they've been duped or they've, you know, thought they were receiving one thing and it turned out to be something very different. Could you just give like a practical first step for what to do with all of that? Like just a how to of, Like what, if they're just like, I don't even know what to do with all of this. I don't even know how to talk to God about it. Yeah. Um, that is a very common feeling, um, of, of thinking that you've very, you, you know, we were talking about the whole, this whole time really is about expectations. And when you're a Christian and you, you believe that, you know, God is leading you and guiding you. And then, then Satan, the accuser comes in and starts saying, well, you know, you knew better about this and you knew, you know, he had this certain aspect of his personality or whatever. Um, so then we start hearing those little voices, you know, telling us, well, you got in the wrong marriage, just the wrong person. First of all, I would say that this mindset of a soulmate is, um, is not true. And actually it was my first husband who said to me one time, a soulmate isn't someone you find it's someone you intentionally and prayerfully become. Mm -hmm. And so When you've loved someone like I did, um, the first time you go, well, that was it. You know, there was my soulmate. And then you get married again and you're like, well, can this person be my soulmate also? Because that first person was my soulmate. Well, yes, they can, because you become a soulmate. You don't find a soulmate. So as Christians, we know that the Bible tells us that man and woman become one and you don't become one overnight. It's something you grow into. So, I mean, in a sense, you become one overnight anyway. But it's something you grow grow into, you know, you become like this person. It's iron sharpening iron. So you don't give up on that. If, if, 
you're not feeling, you feel like maybe, well, yeah, I'm, maybe I married the wrong person. Maybe I did the wrong thing. Actually, no, you didn't. All you're doing is this is, this is the becoming, this is the in-between, this is the, the molding and the shaping and it hurts. It's not easy. You know, there takes, <laughs> it takes parts off of you. Sometimes there's shaving that has to be done. Um, sometimes there's cutting and there's shaping and there's, you know, blood spilt, um, hopefully not literally, but, um, you know, there's just this, this, this ache, um, that comes with becoming one. And especially when you've had, um, you know, previous family or you have a spouse that's still alive, uh, there's that person out there that you share a child with, um, that you still have connections with. So for that person who's really struggling again, hang on. And we're not just hanging on to an ideal. We're hanging on to the promises of God's word. And he never goes back on his word. So it's a matter of getting into the word, understanding what it is that he's promised you. He said that you'll become one with your spouse. Believe it. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Don't listen to what he's saying. This is all your fault, or you did the wrong thing, or you married the wrong person. Anytime you marry anyone, whether it's the first time, second time, third time, 10th time, um, it's going to require some changing on your part. And change is hard for anybody at any time. So, you know, for me, I mean, the, the answer is simple, pray a lot, get into the word, um, put your stake in the ground of God's promises to you and hold on to those. That's where the stability is. When you, when you try to put your stability in your spouse or your love for your spouse or finding a soulmate, or if your children are happy or any of those things, you're just going to be all over the place because those things change with the winds. So you just have to put, you know, everything that you put your faith in what God's word says and hang on to that. So here you are in a blended family. Here you are in a new marriage. Do what you can to make that marriage as strong as you can make that marriage and stop trying to find an ideal. Don't put your hope in Hollywood or in, you know, even in self-help books like mine, put your, your, your hope and your faith in the word of God and trust in those promises. And then wait on him to bring those promises. And while you're in the waiting, which is the hardest place to be, get on your knees and pray yourself through it. You know, there's a lot of truth in fake it till you make it. Um, a lot of times you just got to press on through, focus on the good things and let all the other things fade in the past. And there's, there are many good things to focus on. There are also a lot of very, very negative things that you can, that can distract you, but you know, it's, no one said it was easy. Again, it's, it's a difficult situation. Blended families by definition are broken families. They're broken and you've got to come in and work with what you got. And that's how it is for everybody though. That's, I think a lot of blended family, people in blended families don't realize this. They, they're focused on their own trauma and it is great, but everybody has trauma. Everybody has something in their past that has, um, taking them by surprise. You know, we're all working with these, with these things that we've been given in life and what we've been given is what we've been given. Now, what are you going to do with it? That's the real question. So, you know, you just have to keep having a positive attitude, looking to the Lord and letting him, letting him get you through it. Just like everybody else in the Bible, you know, just like Job, just like David, just like, uh, you know, Abraham and Joseph. I mean, th those guys, they went through their own difficulties and they have paved the way for us to know how to get to the other side. So just keep hanging on, doing what you know is right and keeping your faith in the promises of God's word. That is also good. Sabrina, thank you. What a, the, I mean, those are all just very wise, very good words to live by. And I think that's the foundation of our entire faith and of our prayer lives is having faith in, in God, you know, mm -hmm. the creator of the universe, not the vending machine or the, you know, cosmic Santa, like the God who's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who knows more than we do and whose promises stand firm and not our, our faith should never be built on, uh, the, our ideas of what, what our lives should look like, or even on the prayers that God answers in the affirmative, like that's right. how we need to have faith in who he is, regardless of what we get back from our relationship with him. Yes. And I think that is, that's where joy comes from. 
So, wow. Like, I mean, I think I have a whole, like, I think I only got through like a couple of questions that I sent you as our potential discussion points. So our listeners are just going to have to get your book, A Home Built from Love and Loss, Coming Together as a Blended Family to really get into, you just have so much um, good stuff in there and just so much transparency, so much honesty that I know is going to offer hope and healing to so many people. Um, for, you know, in a, in a number of situations that this will speak to. So thank you so much, Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, that's, that's, that's the prayer is that God would use mm-hmm. the tragedies in my life uh, and, um, and help guide other people through the difficulties they're going through. So thank you. Yeah. Well, where can our listeners connect with you online and on social media and find out about your books? Uh, they can find me online at sabrinamcdonald.com. And I'm also on Facebook, so they can find me, um, Sabrina McDonald on Facebook. So I have a personal Facebook and then a, um, a professional Facebook also. So, Okay, well, how can, we're going to close in prayer. So how can we pray for you today? Um, I think that would be a great prayer. If you just pray that God would use this book and the stories in it to, um, to encourage other people and to help them know they're not alone and um, give me the strength <laughs> to get through and um, get the message out. Yeah, well, we'll do that. Thank you. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for Sabrina, um, just for her her courage, her honesty, her um, wisdom and insight that she has gained through the experience of blending a family, um, for the ways that you are a redeemer who takes grief and unimaginable loss and suffering and reclaims it and repurposes it and uses it to bring glory to yourself, to bring healing and hope and help to others, and um, to just just bring change in, in our own lives, Lord, to transform us through those experiences and make us more like Jesus. Um, I just continue to pray for Sabrina, for her marriage, for her um, for her job as mom to all of her kids in, in her blended family, um, for just her ministry and her writing and just all of the ways that you use her, all of the hats she wears in all of the different arenas. Um, God, we just lift her up today and just pray your blessings would just be poured out on her to overflowing. I just pray for inspiration, for vision, for creativity as she continues with whatever you have next for her. Um, We just ask that you would help her to know the best ways to pour her energy into getting the word out about this book. I know there are just so many things that we feel like we have to do. Um, I just pray that you would show her what you have for her to do that is going to just um, maximize her energy and her efforts. to just open people's eyes to what she has to say, to get this book out to as many people as possible who will need it and use it. And um, we just pray that it would point people to you, that you would break down barriers and walls that would prevent people from having a full relationship with you, that it would silence the lies of the enemy, um, that it would expose lies, that it would reveal truth Um, and that her words would um, open up doorways to a deeper relationship with you, God, and also just open up doorways to deeper relationships within these blended families, um, within um, whatever situation you choose to use this book to to impact in the lives of of people that read it, Lord. Um, We just pray that you would be glorified above above all else. Um, In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.